Picture this. You're stuck in a horrifying situation in the scariest place known to man, Britain. You wake up in a pit surrounded by hooded guys and a shadow man passes you a magical ring that detects whether or not you're visible. When you make your way outside, you realize that you're on the coast. Around every corner, there's hostile and nasty hunters trying to get you for currently unknown reasons. Now, you have one objective on your mind. Get out by any means necessary. Immersive Sims, a genre that really isn't seen much anymore, usually characterized by their linear but incredibly dynamic environments and ways to progress. Because of the way that immersive sims are structured compared to more linear and fast-paced shooters like Doom or Half-Life, it allows for much more slow burn approaches to combat situations. Unfortunately, it's not really a game genre you really see many games come out of anymore. There are many reasons as to why, but the main reason given is many think that it was just a fad in the late 90s and early 2000s and using developmental resources to build an immersive sim as opposed to something more appealing to casual audiences, like an open world RPG, wouldn't be all that worth it. Despite that though, the genre has garnered a major cult following. And for good reason. When done right, immersive sims are absolutely amazing. The genre has spawned classics to its name such as Bioshock, Thief, and the Deus Ex franchise. Because of the way that immersive sims can make you stop and slow down a bit is what I'd say makes more horror-inspired environments work with the gameplay, and ever since it's revealed two years ago, there's been a game that falls under this niche that has caught my attention. That game is Gloomwood. Now, I've played a handful of horror games and a ton of first-person shooters. But despite that, hardly any of them come close to the atmosphere and innovative gameplay that the studio New Blood Interactive levy. Gloomwood is a completely in-house game made by the studio, being headed by Dylan Rogers and David Szymanski. The studio being responsible for publishing little, unknown gems like, oh, I don't know, Dusk and goddamn Ultra Kill. Needless to say, these guys have a good track record of not just finding good talent, but also creating it themselves. Szymanski primarily being involved with the production of Dusk, which you can heavily see the influence of in Gloomwood. Now, these two games are great themselves, but they are also stories need to save for another day. For now, we delve into the Shadow Simulator. I'll break down the game's mechanics as we go along. Every mechanic I'll be explaining will be brought up as I first encountered it. One thing before we do start that I'd like to explain, though, is the order of events I went through, and that what you could possibly go through can be wildly different from what I did. The three different levels in this game are so sprawling and vast that there are literally thousands of possibilities of how you can interact with the world. This game can be beaten in around an hour for a casual playthrough if you're a normal person. I am not normal. Everything shown here is from my first playthrough of the game, so here's how my experience went. We start off in a ditch with draped, hat-wearing hunters with glowing eyes surrounding you from above. One of these figures explains that we are meant to be transported to the city gates by carriage, before abruptly leaving. Once they're gone, a man cloaked in the shadows shows up, referring to you as the Good Doctor. He gives you a ring and breaks you out of your prison before mysteriously teleporting away. You can even see the remains of his particles for after he leaves. Now, we are left free to explore the world. The way stealth works in this game is a little different than how it does in most other games. Crouching by itself doesn't necessarily make you go into stealth mode when moving, and to be completely quiet when moving around, you gotta shift walk. The best comparison I could give to this type of stealth would be the Thief games, and honestly, I see this as a well welcome change to more traditional stealth. It doesn't make regular crouch walking completely redundant though, you could get away with it in a lot of scenarios and sometimes it's even more beneficial to do it. If there's a lone hunter, your footsteps putting it into stealth mode allows you to get them while they're standing still. Gloomwood makes great use of its environment while stealthing around. The game is really dark and it was kind of disorienting at first. But the more I played the game, the more the darkness grew on me. Shadows in this game really feel like deep shadows that you could sit in and not be suspected of hiding inside. The AI is standard, and I could see it getting better in the full release. But for right now, it's fun to dodge around and evade as you peer from corner to corner. The game also introduces one of my favorite aspects of it. 
Tetris. We have a Resident Evil 4 style inventory in this game, and it's one of the most snappy inventory systems I've ever used. The game requires you to completely drag and place an item down in the world to take it out of your inventory. This took a bit of time to get used to, but after a while, it slowly became one of my favorite styles of inventory management. Having your inventory actually be a part of the world and not just some magical box you can pull up at any given moment is a very welcome innovation on a system that's been set in stone for decades. The inventory system is one of the biggest things that was overhauled from the demo. I found this interview from a few years ago detailing the thought process behind this new inventory system, and Dylan explains that the inspirations were taken from both Resident Evil 4 and Ars Vitalis. I actually never heard of this game before until now, but apparently this was the game that carried the inspiration to allow you to physically drag and drop items into the world. One thing that I really like is that the devs really wanted to make the doctor's suitcase believable with what you can carry in it. That's why in the game we have this very strange looking folding shotgun to save up on inventory space inside of the bag. We wanted to keep the element that the, the inventory was like this in-world thing that you like put down. So it was kind of that like blend of those inspirations and... My personal favorite breakage of gameplay norms in Gloomwood, though, is the lack of any sort of heads-up display. In the original beta, your ring was actually a HUD element because you lacked arms. In the early access, though, everything is shown as it is in the world. The only thing remotely resembling a HUD that we do have is obviously the crosshair. But in a game where aiming down sights isn't an option, it's kinda needed. And you could toggle it off in the settings if you really don't want it. Looking at you, security breach, and you're off by default crosshair. Most of the early game is going to be spent just stealthily picking off hunters one by one, and you can get into winnable combat situations with other hunters, but it's not really worth it. Trying to kill a rifle huntsman when it gets aggro is borderline impossible, and the axe huntsman's default running speeds increase tremendously when detected, making your sword block vital, but combat unwinnable if you're in a small area. Going around the fishery, you'll find a room with a safe and a note on it. The note states that there's a revolver in the safe, but you can't see the combination. If you turn the lights off in the room though, the code will reveal itself to you and you'll get the revolver, which is practically useless in this section of the game. Well, not entirely, it's just best not to engage in combat situations with ranged weapons. Two of the three weapons in this demo make a ton of noise when fired, so even taking off a lone guard will most likely alert more to your position. Now remember when I said there aren't any HUD elements in this game? That goes the same with your ammo count too. To check how much ammo you have, you need to physically hold R and check check your barrel for how many rounds you have in it. I love this mechanic. You can even pick up spent revolver rounds that you fired, and you can use them as quieter, throwable objects to distract enemies. That being said though, this is where the companion to your guns come in. Explosive barrels. The best thing in your arsenal when wanting to take out a horde of hunters. Which sounds counterintuitive to what I initially said about noise, because, you know. But when you need to clear out a big wave of hunters in one go, these are an absolute godsend. I got so so many clips of me just rounding up as many hunters as I can get and detonating an explosive barrel on them. Usually the fire kills them before the blast though, so I don't always get to see them explode. After your first contact of explosive barrels, you can enter the next level of the game, the mines. The mines are very structurally different from the fishery. Instead of this huge level where you can explore every room and area as you please, we are now thrown into these linear, claustrophobic caves that sprawl for what feels like an eternity. Everything seems seems pretty normal up until you get to the generator. You need to turn it off to progress past this electric fence, but when you turn off the power, it unlocks something else. These huge dogs wake up out of their cages, and honestly, they're my least favorite enemy type in the game. Even on the current hardest difficulty, they are so easy to stun lock and take forever to charge their attack. Alerting them and backing off as you fight them is a very viable option, even with large groups. Hopefully these guys can get buffed a bit as time goes on to encourage sneaking around them more. Maybe make their stun harder to trigger to put you in a situation where you need to block or take a hit, and make it harder to take them down in large groups. Thankfully, we don't really see much of the dogs in this version of the game. We are taken into a room where we see our good old hunter friends once more. Now some of them are carrying torches. This enemy type also sucks. They take so long to charge your attacks, and despite being one-hit kill enemies on harder difficulties, getting into combat situations with them is very winnable if they are isolated. They're slower than their axe variants, and they have a shorter range weapon that makes them incredibly easy to pick off when alerted. These enemy types should also get a speed boost when aggro, and may 
maybe even have their attack speed increased. Regardless though, after clearing out the mines, there's a shortcut back to the generator room, which you can use to turn back on and use the elevator to get up to the next area of the game, the coast cliffside. In the distance, the lighthouse looms mere meters away. The level design of this area is a lot more akin to the mines as opposed to the fishery. Very linear, with your destination being right in front of you. After you trek past shacks and hunters, you eventually get to this pit area with a hill you need to get up to. This is where the game introduces to you another mechanic, bear traps. They function just as you expect. I found these particularly useful when needing to take out this armored hunter who you can't kill using traditional means. Up the cliff, you get the next weapon, the shotgun. Once again, just like with the revolver, you won't be able to use it that much. If you get yourself into a bad situation, you can maybe take out a group of hunters with the finite amount of ammo you have. But once again, the ammunition will be a lot more useful regarding exploding explosive barrels. After picking off a few more guards and making more strides to your destination, you'd have finally made it to the lighthouse. In it is a note and the last phonograph for you to save at. The way things play out here is a little bit different though. The strange man from the beginning has left you a message. If you're reading this, that means you made it safely to the lighthouse. Good. My store is in the market district. It's not far from here. Rest if you need to, but don't delay. And whatever you do, don't look in the mirror. Of course, we obviously do go look in the mirror. And when we do, this happens. Hello, Doctor. I had hoped for us to meet at my estate. No matter. I can guarantee your safe arrival, a promise few others here can make. The townsfolk are not fond of outsiders. Come to the market plaza before midnight. I will have one of my trusted servants pick you up by carriage. I'll be waiting. After that, the door opens behind you, and the demo ends. The market district and the upstairs of the tavern will be added in later updates. But for now, that's all the gameplay there is in Gloomwood. There's a little secret door in the lighthouse that could take you behind the gate to the entrance of the city, but obviously this area is still under development, so you can't get into it right now. But what you can do is go by this little cliff area and walk down by this gate for this to happen. Anyways, for just being shy of two hours blind, the little content we do have here is still a lot. The finite map selection we do have here is still made up tenfold for the core rooted mechanics present in the game. There's so much you can do with the little you're given, it's actually crazy. You can beat the game in just under three minutes if you wanted to, and half the time you don't even need to use exploits. There is just so much love and care put into this little project so far. All the way down to the settings menu and the goddamn quit game screen. The little details are way more apparent in this game than most other games I have played, no matter how short the experience is. But I don't think I'm missing anything else, so with that, ah. Oh, do you seriously think you covered all there was? How foolish of you! Do you really believe that the only thing there is to a game is its mechanics? You haven't even touched on- No, we're not doing this. Huh? First off, I don't even know who you are. Second off, who gave you the right to just barge into my video as I was speaking? This is the second time in a row this has happened this upload cycle. God damn it, I'm probably gonna have to record all that again now. Well, uh, you see, uh, has been missing for weeks. His channel has been completely inactive for what is basically an eternity to his audience. You just happened to be the closest person by that was talking about something similar to what he would, so I, uh... So you decide to bother me instead. No, you simple little worm! If you would just let me speak, you would understand exactly why I'm here, you... Ho 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 ho, you've done it this time, Lankman. Hopping through other channels isn't going to get you out of paying rent. Wait, is that the real reason why you're here? Oh, not you. I told you I would get it to you later. Look.
look, you've been due for three weeks, Lankman. I'm not letting you get away. Pay up already. <laughs> Damn you two! I gotta get out of here. I wonder what that purple dog thing is up to. See you later. What? Do you know what that guy's deal was? Ugh, yeah, yeah, I know him. He gets real upset whenever you don't talk about strictly horror content, especially in topics that have that as a key driving point. He also owes me a ton of rent money. So, do you think you'd want to go deal with that? Eh, I'll deal with it later. Eh, surely he's not gonna do much harm wherever he went. Well, alright. I hate to admit it, but he was kind of right, though. Now that I'm thinking about it, there's a ton of stuff that I miss regarding the atmosphere and ambience in this game. I mainly just kind of focused on the gameplay that I liked. Maybe there is a little bit more to this game that I was first able to realize. What do you think? Oh yeah, definitely. This game is leaking with style and atmosphere. Usually, that's my favorite thing to discuss when talking about games like these. Alright, well since you seem more knowledgeable on this side of making a good and immersive game, you care to take it away for a little bit? Oh, yeah, sure, alright. I mean, I do have a bit to say about this game myself anyway, so uh, this could be fun. While Gloomwood may not be a game that is entirely focused on its horror aspects, the game is drenched in an ominous atmosphere which allows the player to become extremely immersed in the world it's trying to create. The visual style is used perfectly in conjunction with the sound design to breathe life into the sinister setting that is Gloomwood. A perfect example of how we see these two aspects used together is clearly seen with the main enemies of the game, the Huntsmen. These eerie draped figures walk about most of the areas of the game, speaking with low, gravelly voices and coughing violently. They appear human at first, but the way they sound and look paired with some descriptions that can be read about them in the game makes you second guess this. If they are human, then the fear of them stems from the idea of what drove them to this point of hunting other people for their supposed sickness. And if they aren't human, the fear stems from the possibility of what terrifying things are behind the masks and glowing goggles they wear. The Huntsmen, as well as some other enemies, work to create a very oppressive atmosphere, making the player want to stay hidden for as long as possible. What brings these enemies to a whole new level, however, is the way the environment is used alongside them. The locations seen in Gloomwood often have a lot of life to them, with many aspects of them being put to creative use by the game's mechanics, as well as increasing the immersion. My favorite example of this is seen when we venture outside for the first time at the docks. We can hear the sound sound of the many huntsmen marching about while the waves of the water splash against the dock. All of this happening while a lighthouse in the distance occasionally shines its light on the area. I always found this area to be brilliant since I first entered it. The area being limited to a small dock with little places to hide under makes it easy for the player to feel constantly exposed, and if the dock itself didn't completely convey that idea, then the lighthouse certainly does. The light from the lighthouse is an amazing touch to the area. Not only does it make the player feel far more vulnerable every time it passes by, but it actually plays a part as a mechanic in the area. Every time the light passes by, your ring faintly glows to let you know that you are easier to see. This clever use of the environment creates far more stress for the player by bringing about more danger in a creative and unique way. And it's not just the dock that plays on this. Another great example of how the environment creates this oppressive atmosphere comes in the form of the caves. In this area, we're introduced to a far more dangerous enemy in the form of the dogs. The way the area builds up suspense towards our inevitable first encounter with this new threat was possibly my favorite moment in the entire game. We slowly make our way through the cave accompanied by a deep ambient track which makes the place feel wet and alive. With each new part we pass by, we encounter many notes warning that the dogs will escape captivity if the power is removed from the cave system. And it's only after receiving this warning that we begin to realize that in order to properly progress through the cave, the power has to be disabled. 
having the game warn us of the dogs after the fact, or even just having them appear out of nowhere after we've disabled the power, would have been effective on its own. But to have the game explicitly warn us that our actions will put us in direct danger was a much more terrifying way to build up suspense, especially paired with all the things we encounter after they've been freed. Mangled corpses scattered through the caves, open cages showing us just how many of these threats are now active, and the sound of growling and sniffing can all be seen and heard until eventually we encounter the first of these monsters. Now, in actuality, the dogs aren't very different from your regular huntsmen. They move a bit faster and pack quite a punch, but overall they're very similar mechanically. This didn't stop me from being terrified of these guys in my initial playthrough though. The way the atmosphere and environment built up to these things made them seem like a force to be reckoned with, and from that alone I went through the entire cave system as cautiously as possible. These two examples are only small pieces of the whole that makes this game work so effectively from a horror standpoint. The art, the sound design, and even the small tidbits of storytelling present work to make this place feel alive and oppressive. And speaking of storytelling, I think it's time I handed the mic back to Dags. I'm gonna go hunt after old Lankman and make sure he doesn't invade any other of my friends' channels. Goodbye for now! Oh, well, since he's gone, it gave me time to think about one more thing I overlooked regarding this game, and that's the lore. <laughs> Gloomwood obviously doesn't have its full story laid out entirely just yet. This early access is probably going to be the first quarter of the game, if that. So there's going to be so much more revealed as time goes on and further updates are released. With that being said though, there's already a ton that we can piece together with the little we're given. And it all starts with our main protagonist, the Doctor. Not much, if anything, is known about the Doctor. All that we know is that he has some sort of importance to the Huntsmen, as they were tasked to bring him to the city gates before he gets broken out. I can't really comment much on the man who breaks us out of our prison, other than he certainly has a good idea of what is going on. It was teased that he would have a shop in later updates based on his ending dialogue. So, unlike us, this man may be a local resident of this supposedly cursed town. All the Huntsmen, whatever they are, seem to be infected with some sort of sickness, coughing violently several times when in hearing range of them, and some of them even going mad, as we saw inside the shack on the coast cliffside level. If you enter the starting shack, you can actually see a note from another Huntsman talking about him. We were hunting some wild boars earlier, and one of the pigs got caught in the traps. I went to bag it, and one of the older hunters, Boris, just started going at it with an axe. He wouldn't stop until the meat was ruined and the organs and bones were everywhere. When he turned back, he regained composure and couldn't remember any of it. Worst of all is that none of us even did anything. We just watched. I'm going out to the city tomorrow to see if someone, anyone, knows what's going on. At some point, the Huntsmen seem to have been relatively normal people, running a fishery, a mining colony, and several bases of operations set up outside the city gates. It seems that one day though, some sort of plague came down upon the colony, and turned them into what we see now. The descriptions of their rifles stating that the guns were made for the warped proportions of the Huntsmen seems to give away the idea that these people have transformed in some way. The sickness warping their anatomy and causing them to have an appearance different to that of a human. It can be the same reason why the dogs look the way they do, or how there's supposedly a beast that got loose in the tavern. Judging how there was special equipment put into place for these huntsmen, it means that this must have been the norm for a while now. A note in the fishery all but confirms this, stating that a man named Dr. Corp did everything for a woman named Sylvia, getting her a seat in something known as the Mercantile Council, and how he would dispose of figures that she found unsavory. When all hell broke loose, yokel mercenaries started breaking into his factory. The note ends with these two lines. I kept my end of the bargain. Years of empty promises. Was I really this blind all along? Curse you, Sylvia. May this rotten town take you with it. In the room, you could see the chair and the rope Corp supposedly used to commit suicide. It seems that the Huntsmen were able to siege the last of his property, though, as the corpse is no longer there. This Sylvia character seems to be a mystery at first, but I have a feeling we have already met her. We can hear two other Huntsmen talk about her later on in the game. It's obvious that the woman in the mirror is meant to be this Sylvia character. Her role is still super unknown, but this is what I've been able to put together so far. 
At one point, there was a British colony that specialized in many forms of industry. Fishing, mining, sailing, etc. At some point, a plague came down the town, causing the locals to warp and shift into physically and mentally deranged individuals who can snap at any given minute. Along with that, the sickness has also taken over other forms of life too. The others we get to see being the hounds, a hint to some sort of beast in the tavern, and this Plague Doctor-esque figure that runs past us at the end of the game. In some way, Sylvia and possibly other members of this mercantile council are responsible for this curse being brought upon the now wretched town. The only people not seeming to be infected are us, the mysterious man helping us, and Sylvia herself. I have my beliefs that this strange man may have been a part of the Mercantile Council at some point. He is shown to have access to powers such as teleportation and warns us not to look in the mirror. The same mirror where we first encounter Sylvia. With the abilities that this strange man seems to have, on top of the knowledge he seems to hold, it tells me that he was also once a part of this currently very mysterious council. Whatever their motives are, or were, or how this curse came upon the town, or how our protagonist role in this larger-than-life story is even applicable still remains a mystery, one that will most likely be solved in the full release of Gloomwood. In conclusion, this game has a really good head on its shoulders. Being headed by veteran developers and a studio with a great track record to bat, it's no doubt in my mind that the full release will blow me away even further than the early access did. I see a ton of potential in Gloomwood, and maybe just as we will potentially lift the curse of the town, perhaps Gloomwood will continue to fight the curse that holds the immersive sim genre down. But the message you should really take from this game... <laughs> never go to Birmingham. I've been Dags, and until next time, watch my buddy Posture Spec's first episode of his analog horror series, Dreams of an Insomniac. He helped out a ton with the production of this video, and I can tell that he put so much passion and care into crafting this first installment in a hopefully long-running horror series. And with that being said, Happy Halloween. I've been Dags, and until next time, see ya.